and there's that piece in the middle where we did the song yes that was so fun yes i thought uh julia was remarkably gentle with you uh, she's very I, good i cannot make that same promise there will be no sing-alongs here oh come on now this is uh cool cast it is uh november 10th or 11th depending where you are 2011 uh and this is the last leg of the rhizome 2011 dave cormier for change 11 tour uh it has been a very full week i believe this is your fifth session in as many days um five how, for five how, how's your week been um <clears throat> it's been really good I've gotten um, I've got some echo, Jeff. You're getting echo from mm -hmm. me. Just Are so you know. Uh, any chance you've got the EdTech Talk Live window open? It's possible. I'll check for it. Um, so yeah, it's been a. Uh, I wouldn't call it a humbling week exactly, but it's certainly been a week where a lot of the, my sort of uh, presumptions have been tested, and and some of the things that. I haven't spent maybe as much time thinking about as maybe I should have <laughs> been challenged, uh, which is all good. You know, it's not a that's a positive thing. Um, it's really you know at the start of this week I said the one thing that's going to bother me is the positivists. It was. <laughs> uh, it's you know, if you're going to come to the conversation, at, and if I'm hosting a conversation, make some effort, not to agree with me, I'm not looking for people to tell me I'm right, but make some effort to understand the conversation you're in. So th that's that's the only sort of criticism I have at all, is that there were a couple of people who, there's a guy who uh, today posted on his blog, the rhizome metaphor doesn't work for me, so it's wrong. <laughs> Sounds like a fact. Okay. <laughs> Uh, you know, so but other than that, you know what I, I I understand probably twice as much of what I'm talking about than I did five days ago. Yeah, it's really been fantastic. Um, so the week started off with us asking you on EdTech Weekly for the elevator pitch of what is rhizomatic learning, and this is your fifth session in as many days. So I'm not going to do that. Instead, Good. I'm going to ask for your subway pitch. You get a whole subway <laughs> stop. Uh, you get two stops. Uh, the first stop, I'd like you to detail the metaphor. What is rhizomatic learning? Okay. And then you get another stop, to, and, and not so much the implications for everything else, just what is the, the metaphor for rhizomatic learning? And you get another stop to lay out the nomad. Tell us about the nomad. All right, mm. all aboard. First stop. What is rhizomatic learning? Okay, the rhizome is a metaphor posited by Deleuze and Qatari. Okay, so it's a philosophical metaphor based in postmodern French theory. It comes after. It's modeled after the rhizome, which is the sort of middle part of uh, a lot of different plants and the ways in which it spreads. Okay, so the rhizome is a stem-like thing that goes around underground, shoots out roots underneath it, and pops out shoots on top. So the plant comes up, the roots go down. So an aspen grove is a rhizome. A lot of the plants in your gardens are, are rhizomes. They have a couple of very interesting qualities about them that Deleuze and Guattari use to sort of talk about the way the world might actually really be. And that's that it's a multiple. It's not a single thing. And they oppose it to a tree to an arboreal, so it's rhizomatic arboreal. A tree is one entity, you point at it, it's got roots, it's got leaves, it's got a stalk, and you're done. One thing, that's the thing I'm looking at, right? It's the positivist standpoint. It's the, there are things in the world that I point to, and if I want to know about a tree, it's over there, and I can just talk about it. The rhizome is hard to point to. It's the, a rhizomatic plant is one that has many kind of shoots and stalks and roots and it's connected all together and it's all kind of networked but it's hard to point at it and identify what the one thing is it's a multiple it's many things together right and when you take that point of view of learning then it's not so simple as to just give people the thing that they need to point at the thing that you need to learn the point at the thing that that's important it's more about looking at things in a broader multiple perspective and in this metaphor the rhizome is 
the learner, the course, the process? A good one. Um, the rhizomatic conception is a lens through which to look at things, right? So it's all of those things, depending on what you're looking at. It's a tool that you take out. It's like, um, it's like a pair of binoculars, or better, maybe a microscope. When you use the microscope, it doesn't change the thing that you're doing. It's a way of looking at the thing that changed. Well, it, in a sense, it does change the thing you're doing, but it, it allows you to take a different perspective on that thing. And the rhizomatic metaphor is the same way. So I can talk about it as the process of learning and the way that things connect. And I feel I'll equally feel comfortable talking about it as what knowledge is, right? Depending on what we're talking, it's that metaphor is applicable maybe, uh, I find it useful is a better way of saying it, can be useful as a way of looking at any kind of system. So what it does is it breaks down that arboreal standpoint, that idea that there are just things that we have to put together and things will be fine, but rather it's complicated and multiple and there are many different ways of looking at it. And if we take that standpoint on any of those topics, um, it changes the way that we look at them. Okay, now arriving at uh, rhizome stop number one. It's Please so watch your than last Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing what uh, going through five days of intensia. And now, next stop, tell us about the nomad. Well, the nomad, uh, and again, from a, um, it's and, and and Terry took issue with my usage of particularly the image of the nomad, the one that I use in my presentation, and he's probably right. It's probably argumentative. I would have been way better staying with the Lego figures, um, which is why I use the Lego figure with the soldier, because I didn't want to argue about it, because um, it's not the point. The nomad is in the rhizomatic learning theory and, and pulled from Deleuze and Guattari, uh, because there's a point at which you need to talk about what the learner is doing, not just the learning process, not just the knowledge or whatever that is, but where are the responsibility, what are the changes that, that are involved in that? And for me, the nomad as a goal, the nomad as a, as a what we want from education is a nice one because it allows us to talk about independence and responsibility and decision making inside of that process. And again, the big one there is responsibility because you, you make your choices, you find your paths, you follow them along and you follow the rhizome. So, there's where the nomad comes in. He's really the learner in the in the story, in the parable of the rhizome. Um, because I don't like talking about learning without having some kind of way. Of, because in practice, and any time I've ever tried to, to use this perspective, that personal responsibility of the learner is everything. If you come to the learning process ready to adapt and learn and change and do those things and become, which is the, the sort of main message here, you're fine. You're going to be fine. You're going to work it out. If you expect the curriculum, the course, the learning process, whatever else, to do the work for you, to make decisions for you, then you're just passively accepting. And that's, that's it. So the nomad's the opposite. It's not passive acceptance, it's independence, responsibility, that kind of stuff. All right. Nicely done. I think you can graduate. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to what I want to focus on a little bit tonight is, or today, is the gardening aspect of this. You know, I heard you, you mention... Look at you, you're in Korea. <laughs> <laughs> um, I heard you mention it. We have a reverse roles. I'm coffee, your beer right now. Um, you know, I heard you talk about that it's really impossible to... Is that coffee beer? Yes. Wow. That's like two great things in one. I <laughs> know. Um, I, you know, I, I heard you say that you really can't give details on how to apply this because how you would do it is so different from how other people would do it. It's a mm -hmm. very individual process. Um, but mm -hmm. I want to get into some of this process of when you embrace this approach as a learner or an educator or an administrator. Or both. Uh, or both. Uh, there's a gardening process that needs to happen. So I want to yeah. get into that, but I also want to deal with some of the comments from your buddy George Siemens um, who posted today. <clears throat> and he I sure just did. had to laugh <laughs> in the first couple of paragraphs. He said, it seems like there's a lingering discomfort with networks in Cormier's view of knowledge and learning. He hasn't tackled this discomfort directly. Perhaps he's trying to be polite, which just made me laugh. Uh, or perhaps he's still thinking through the nature of that discomfort. Uh, and he goes on to talk about how... That part's true, actually. That's exactly what it is. I'm still thinking through my nature of the discomfort. But go ahead. Uh, 
and then he goes on to talk about how um, uh, he you view rhizomes as a metaphor for learning, and um, does he think that learning is like a rhizome, or is he making a bolder statement and saying that learning is a rhizome? Um, so there's all sorts of metaphor issues, and then he gets into kind of a defense of networks. Uh, what's your response to George on all that? How could I possibly come from my point of view and say that anything is anything? Um, <laughs> so that's my first response. I can't even be in that discussion. So I'm automatically, obviously going to say that it isn't, or it that I can't claim that it is, because what would that even mean to claim that it is a rhizome? Um, it's a metaphor. It has really, it's been really effective for me. I wrote it down originally because I wanted to um, sort of get a sense of what I was thinking. Other people kind of liked it. I was looking to try to get my start sort of publishing stuff. And then all of a sudden realized that I didn't even care if it was getting published. I wanted to work the idea out. So I had that, that transition. Um, but I can't use that language. And in my comment on the bottom of that page, I said, look, you're taking what is, amounts to a platonic view of knowledge, and I, I can't answer those questions because I don't see them that way. The other point um, he makes is that a network involves connecting to external entities, whereas a rhizome, basically, one rhizome has the same DNA, essentially. Yeah. Uh, where does the external component fit into the rhizome model? Um, it... <laughs> I, I, that, that's probably the biggest criticism of the rhizome metaphor across the board. I remember Stephen saying that a couple of years ago. Um, and it, to me, it's extending the metaphor past where I'm sort of going for Because I don't care about the content, right? What we're talking about is the process. Uh, the content comes out. And those shoots that come up are realizations. The contents of them is not what I'm talking about. Um, it, it, they're just it's not meant to address that particular issue. So to some degree, the nomad's in there to take up that role of the independent sort of person that has the knowledge happening, but that's that's on the other side of the, the metaphor. Um, so, how, yeah. How do I, mom and dad rhizomes make baby rhizomes? Is there a cross-pollination process? Or? No. You split them in half and throw them in two different gardens. Oh yeah, no, pardon me, there is a pollination process as well. They can't, like, um, I have them out in the backyard. They do flower and they do pollinate normally as well. Says, sorry, yes, they okay. do. That's but you second. can also just break a rhizome in half and throw them like this and have two of them. They're like worms. And they both have the same DNA? I think if you split them in half and threw them in different corners, they would have the same DNA, yeah. Like those, like I say, the aspen groves are really neat because it's tough to know whether or not you can call them an organism, but the thing that's there has been there for a million years. Um, and is it an organism? Is it a, and again, then you're into that weird place where you're trying to use words to categorize things that the words weren't meant for. So call it an organism or don't. And again, that's, that's where I come down, right? I don't care if it's an organism. It's, useful to get to the next place and I think that one of the places where um, I think it was Keith Hammond took you guys to task for keep trying to corner me into a definition from that a lot of people listened to that and came up with some really I don't think we've ever gotten that much response for anything we've ever done yeah so fun or not for years anyway um, but I don't care <laughs> and, and I know and I know that's that's the that's the problem with trying to explain this inside of an educational system where, you know, we try to break everything down into tiny little categories. And I just, I've got two tweets right there that I just, I don't know how to answer where somebody is saying, tell me what the model, how the model applies to this. I'm like, it's not really a model. I mean, you can call it one, I guess, and it kind of works like one sometimes, but I don't care if it's a learning theory or a model or whatever else. I can tell you the story of, of what it means. I can tell you a story about how it applies to things. I can tell you how it affected my work. I can tell you how I see it in other people's work. In terms of defining it and putting in a little box in this stuff, I mean, if you want to, go ahead. I won't stop you. But it's not of any real, I don't even know how to talk about that. 
Like it's it's weird. I don't think, right. I, I think I've completely diverged from what you asked. But. Well, I want to embrace the messiness and uh, open up this hangout to uh -oh. larger circles. Uh, hopefully some people will be stopping by. If anyone is listening, I will also toss in the hangout link into the chat room at edtechtalk.com slash live. Yeah, it works, the coffee beer thing. This is a different one. Um, I got a taster pack. Oh, what fun. And this is... um. Yeah, it is. It's it's like a you pull it out and you're like, I don't even know what this is. I will try it. It's great. Almost well, not rhizomatic beer, but um, one of the things you mentioned, <laughs> uh, I believe it was in the conversation with Julia, and I just have to say, Julia is a new media talent. She's isn't she great? Charming and smart and smooth, and and she has that patience that you need, right? People are doing stuff all over the place, and just kind of she just kind of smiles into the mic into the camera, in that well, we got time. It's all good. Yeah. yeah, she's really good. Uh, I think one of the things you mentioned was that for you, it was really kind of a, a gratifying week or a learning week because all of a sudden, all these really smart people were engaging with your ideas and saying, ah, well, this is what I think rhizomatic learning is. And your response was, yeah, yeah, yeah that's what I was saying. What are some of those things that you've, you've learned or you've thought about or that's been fleshed out for you by some of these smart Change 11 people? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the one of the fun ones, and and she's not nearby for me to to admit it to her. Uh, Bonnie's blog post is really really good, uh, and the way she talks about the way she used. And I mean, the the term lens is one that's a very common one in our house. Um, but I don't know why I've never tried to use it in this context before, because it really does. When you talk about it as a lens, when you talk about the the a metaphor as a lens, everybody knows what that means. You know, you're going like this to look at something. And it's it in itself is a metaphor that gives you a sense of what we're talking about. You know, the rose colors glasses. You put them on and the whole world is, is beautiful. You know, it it changes your perspective. And if you think of the metaphor that way and you explain it to people that way, um, that allows for a little bit less literal interpretation, you know. Um, Keith Hammond, uh, he's that's not new. Keith Hammond has been writing beautiful things about my work for three years and someday I own a house like he just he's done such nice writing and writes so clearly and I've actually learned a great deal about Deleuze from reading him write about Deleuze about me because he is Deleuze is ridiculous like it really is have you ever did you ever pick any of it up or look through any of it I think I've looked at like a paragraph and was like yeah no I don't even know what he I, yeah, understanding it, what you're doing is hard enough it's uh, yeah no it's it's crazy like it really is it's and it literally is crazy in the sense that it differs completely from what we would normally think of as sanity so it pushes you in a completely different direction anyway he's been really great I found um, the vehemence of Terry's response and that sort of alienation stuff really useful in the sense that it reminds me that I'm not just trying to to convince people to look at other perspectives that the the detrius the the, the, the the collateral damage of a discussion is often more important than the content and I would say that about anything you know what that's that's the way I look at the world it's always about the stuff that comes around but I forget about that in my own presentation. So, because a lot of Terry's comments weren't about the metaphor no, the, or rhizomatic no, learning, it were, was about the methodology of your presentation. Were, and 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 again, he loves the way I did the presentation, and reiterated it in his last comment today that he really thought the facilitation was well done. But you know, when you ask the question, "Why do we teach?" and you don't preface it in the as a facilitator by saying, "Look." I'm not looking to take a run at the education system here. What I'm looking to do is challenge our assumptions about this specific thing. When you don't focus it like that, you allow for too much chaotic damage, which shuts people out basically because they disagree with the single undercurrent, which has nothing to do with what you're talking about. And you know, you and, did. I was listening to the audio recording, and you did preface it by saying, you know, we're not looking to burn down buildings here. You know, you, you had sort of laid some of that foundation. Did I but, say that? Yeah. Oh, that was smart of me. Yeah. So I'm sorry. I'm I very impressed with myself. No, no, that's fine. So I, I find that really useful, that reminder that um, that that's coming, you know, that, that, that anything that you do in that sense, particularly when you're talking in terms of what are, I don't know about revolutionary, but certainly very different ideas for some people, 
And I also found, like, I don't know um, what show it was I was talking about it, that, that woman from the Netherlands who was talking about her corporate training, that, that sense of recognition where she read whatever it is I wrote and said, man, that just gives me a way to explain something I've known for 15 years and known it over and over and over again. And there are probably 15, 20 people during the course of the last five days where their blog comes up and they go, I, I read the first line and I go, I know exactly how this is going. And I've known this the whole time and it suits exactly. And I think there's a subsection that it particularly suits, you know, crazy thinkers, maybe. And there's a subsection it, it doesn't. I mean, there, there is such a, a discomfiture yeah. with this. And even like, you know, Terry Anderson. I mean, Terry Anderson is not some, you know, fixed thinking newbie to technology. I mean, he has embraced all of this. But even mm. for him, this kind of, and I would say your presentation sort of, embraced rhizomatics in terms yeah, of its for sure. methodology. Yeah, I've tried my best to actually make those be rhizomatic. Um, I, I think it was off-putting. I think you allow for a lot le a lot more chaos and random sort of surprise in those, right? So you never, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, we, I did that presentation twice in a span of two weeks, right? Almost exactly the same presentation. I bounced the slides around a little bit. I add the, added the thing about Bruno Latour and black boxing. But other than that, it was the same presentation. I got a very, very different response from one week to the next. And there's 10 people in the chat room who are in both conversations. But still, they take on a tone. Like, they take on this sort of... And I was much more um, off-put in the second one than I was in the first. Because I started it, and I wasn't getting the response that I was expecting. And I had some... There was some weird vibes going on in the way the questions were coming in, and I got sort of sidetracked a little bit and a little bit not, I wasn't quite as settled as I normally am. And I think that probably impacted the presentation as well. But that's, that's the neat thing about the whole process, right? Is that we think of education as a sanitary process. And well, not all of us. Else, well, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you were kind of on the same page there. But I mean, when you look at it in a theory perspective, you know, you got to do this and you do this and you get this outcome. But realistically, the rest of the world isn't like that at all. Like when you go out and actually try to do something, you know, you look at, I think of uh, like your radio gig in, in Pusan. You know, you never know what people are looking for and what it's going to work out to. And, and, you know, from week to week, things change and shift. And that's what the rest of life is, for, is about. It doesn't make sense to me to educate in any other kind of way. What advice or suggestions do you have for people who are trying to do this stuff? Nancy, uh, Nancy White and I were in your presentation earlier today kind of going back and forth about the buffet model versus, you know, a, a single meal and how both mm. of us kind of try to offer the buffet, but the feedback we get from students and other, can you please go step by step? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, for people who are trying this and saying, all right, you know, pursue your learning passions and be a rhizome, and they're mm -hmm. getting this kind of feedback, in your experience doing this, is there anything you can do to, to help those who are struggling with this? Well, there's a couple of things. Like when I, um, nobody's actually asked me how the courses go. I'm really surprised about that, actually, but nobody's ever asked me. I posted the syllabus, I did the whole thing. I teach like this, but nobody said, what happens in those classes anyway? Um, I lose at least one student every course, at least one, who the second day comes up to me and goes, I have no idea what you're doing, or I see what you're doing, but I can't do this. And they walk out the door. Always happens. Um, it's, a, it's a violent act, really, to do this to a classroom. Um, and the second day is usually really hot. Like, they're struggling and trying to figure out what I'm trying to do. And I keep going. Has, has the way you frame it evolved? I feel like that's so yeah. significant because like. Yeah, I think it has. How can you frame it in a way that's less scary? Well, I, I think for me, it's become part of the work of doing the, the, the research and, the, and talking about this has been becoming comfortable with it as a, as an approach. Um, and again, I almost said the word model, and it kind of is, but as a way of thinking around the learning process. 
Um, and now I'm more than willing to walk in and go, look, the thing you're about to do is a bit weird. And it's kind of kind of make you a little frustrated here. But I've done this enough to know that by this day, this is going to happen. And by this day, this is going to happen. And you're going to find this. But the reason we're doing this is because of this other thing. And so much of what the process is about is about transparency. And I think that that's really the most important thing is to try to get them on board. The problem is that we all have different abilities to do that. Um, and it doesn't suit a lot of different, like if you're trying to do, and one thing I have never done this with that I would like to try and don't know if it will work is academic writing because the outputs are so concrete. You know, people need to understand this thing and they need to understand this thing and they need to understand, I can tell you what they need to understand. Um, so I would like to try it, but I don't know what's going to happen. And with the so course- I'm like, sorry, to teach an academic writing course in a rhizomatic way mm -hmm. and still wind up with that very yeah. defined yeah, I don't output. know if you can do it. I don't know if you can do it. And I wouldn't risk a classroom's ability to understand the rules they're supposed to follow, which is what academic writing is about, right? It's not learn how to write. It's there's this set of rules that people are expecting you to follow, and I need to make sure that you know what those rules are. Now, there's play, parts in there for, for creativity. So, you know, I, I love the argument. I know it's surprising to you. The argument side of a of, a, of an academic writing course, because in that part I probably do teach rhizomatically when I think about it, because I don't care how you come to argue. I don't care what path you take, and if you know when you look around the classroom, the thing that they're going to grab onto and the approach they're going to take is going to be different for every student. But it doesn't matter what they do, as long as they come to understand that what they're supposed to do inside the the, the, the writing process is take a position and defend that position in ways that, that are going to convince somebody else. And that's about imagining what somebody else is doing and how you're going to convince them. And those kinds of things, I guess. So there are places where, and this happened in the, I don't know what conversation, it was in the ECI in Alex course two weeks ago, where I said, you know, it doesn't, you don't need to run a whole course this way or a whole program or a whole school. If there's a piece of it that's particular, find a piece that's particularly well suited and take a run at it. And say, so, you know, while you know, there's these eight things that are happening in this course, this one stream is one that always seems a bit weird and requires a lot more flexibility. And it, you follow that stream along with that process and let them build through there. They're still going to develop that skill, those literacies around, you know, being nomads and taking responsibility in those things. Maybe not as profoundly, but take the pieces that, that it works for. Like, don't try to hammer it in. I hammer it in because it's my personality, right? I don't mind standing in front of the middle of 25 people who are mad at me. I think um, you kind of enjoy it. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't actually enjoy them being mad at me. I don't actually enjoy making them uncomfortable just to do it. I do think, I honestly believe that discomfort is part of the learning process. So I think of it as my responsibility to do it. And I honestly believe that those students do better out of the course having gone through it that way. So I take it on as my responsibility to put them in that position. I don't, I'm not afraid of it, but if I could do it in a way that didn't make them sort of cry, that'd be better. Um, you know, when you first started writing about this, oh, so long ago, uh, mm -hmm. community was a key component to yeah. what you were writing about. Uh, where does that fit in to the metaphor and what role does that play in a teacher saying, okay, I want to teach rhizomatically, what's the community mm -hmm. component? Well, there's, there's four years of experience since that, and uh, understanding the whole community conversation is a lot more complicated than I thought it was. Um, and it's a lot harder to do, you know. We, we uh, at Tech Talk, for instance, just kind of materialized, you know, this, this community of people who all work together and blah, 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 blah. I found since then that doing that again is not exactly a walk in the park. Um, you know, there are instances and times where those things kind of magically happen, I think. Um, some of it's work and some of it's luck and some of it's you know, happenstance and need and all kinds of other things. Um, <coughs> but 
So, so I, I, I need to rethink, and I did with the second article, which I don't think has been posted anywhere. I wrote two rhizome learning, published two rhizomatic learning articles. The second one, I don't think anybody's even looked at during the, the, this course, and what it talks about is a separation between a community model and a guild model. So the connections, let's say, I'm going to stretch the metaphor here. I haven't actually put it in words this way, but the connection between the nomads is either this guild type connection where you have sort of formal processes that people need to appeal to and you put together um, sort of ranking systems that allow people to understand in artificial ways where they fit and everybody knows what it means to succeed inside that system. And the other one is that more open sort of community model. Um, and what I really need to do from a conceptual standpoint is go back, take the original community as curriculum stuff, map it up against this guild community distinction um, and then pull that all together and I'm actually writing an article for a book that's due oh shit the beginning of January I think um, that's hoping to do just that and, and actually bring the community part back in because I, I mean I see change right? 11 as an excellent example of community as their curriculum you know yeah, I mean, I think you're so planting too. the seeds and this has been a really robust week of a lot of thinking a lot of conversation I think it's gone pretty well well, I feel I, pretty good about this week. I, I, I would concur. I think you and Nancy have kind of revitalized Change 11. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it seems to have a, a more engaged energy <clears throat> than it what did for a little while. Um, I want to get back to gardening. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. someone embraces this. They, they're managing their course right. as rhizomatically as they can. What, as, at, on different levels, as a learner, how do you garden your rhizome as a teacher having this community as curriculum rhizome? How do you, mm -hmm. what's your role in clipping and shaping the rhizome? Um, I think. While you're thinking, I just wanted to say, speaking of community, I'd love for people to uh, join in. I, I haven't talked to you one-on-one -on -one this long since we were drinking soju in Korea, probably. Um, uh, and I will put the Hangout link again into the text chat at edtechtalk.com slash live. Everyone's welcome. Uh, join in. So, yes, gardening the rhizome. Uh, the first thing is setting the context, right? So it's about creating that garden with nice wooden stakes that drive deep in the ground and saying, look, this is what we're dealing with here. And actually, I did this to Jeffrey Kiefer in that talk, and he, he made comments about it in about four different blog posts, um, where I said, look, I understand the power issue you're talking about. That's not what we're talking about today. And I think that one of the things you really, really need to do is make sure that, to some degree, the broad thing that you're trying to cover ends up being where you're going. Otherwise, it's the internet. And I love the internet. I think it's great. But if you're going to have a course, what you're doing is deciding that I'm going to pull every, like for like this week, I'm going to pull everybody together and I'm going to say this week, I'm going to pick this thing over here that we're going to talk about. And I'm going to put the energy out to keep us together on that discussion. Right? And to make sure that as we make connections and all those things that we stay within this garden. Because this is what we're doing. If we don't So you're do not that, totally anti-structure. Oh, God, no. No, I'll tell you, look... If you look at something like, um, do you know what appreciative inquiry is? I've been talking about this a lot lately. So it's Let's say I don't. Mind. Okay, appreciative inquiry is a way of doing, let's call it strategic planning, where you go in and you talk to people about the things they think are best about their organization. And you pull all that together and you find themes and you from there you build visioning statements and goals for the future. In talking about appreciative inquiry, what I've said, at least, is... Yes, the inner part of the connections and the talking and the back and forth, very soft stuff, very imaginative and whatever. Because of that, the structure of how you do it has to be laid in big stone blocks. Because otherwise, it just gets messy all over the place. You need to have a, we're going to do this and we're going to do this and we're going to do this. Not the content, just the structure. And I think the same is true. If you look at, look at the live slides thing, that you... I don't think there's anything I do that's more scripted than those. Now, I don't have a script to speak from, but 
with blah 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 in my mouth. I don't need one. Um, but it's four pictures, empty page. Four pictures, or three or four pictures, empty page. Four pictures, empty page. Section discussion or intro section discussion as it goes through. Right? There's this whole thing carved into the ground. Now, within that, you can do whatever the hell you want. But we're doing this, right? And otherwise, it's just a coffee shop conversation. And coffee shops are fantastic places. But you don't choose. And the whole agenda for me was looking at EdTech Talk and going, this really freaking works. How do I do it on purpose? You know, because you, you can't get EdTech Talk to do something for you. It's not a hammer. You can't just. No, but I mean, it, it, was, it was built intentionally. Not that we had a firm grasp yes. of the destination. But I can't get EdTech Talk to spend three weeks talking about rhizomes. Well, you've done you've got done it for about one week. <laughs> no, 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 no. But like, you know, but in terms of, oh, I don't know what community like uh, the other shows are doing. You know, it's not it's not that kind of thing. And that's the thing about a community. You can you know ask your friends to come over and help you build a barn, but you can't get them to all put their signal light on when they turn left. So applying that to the classroom, you build this learning community. That's the curriculum. And you say, okay, we're Ed Tech Talk, we're talking about educational technology. This course, we're talking about academic writing or whatever the subject is. Uh, go pursue your rhizome, rhizomatic desires. As a teacher, what if, if you want them to talk about something in particular? How, how do you balance the, okay, we need to head here eventually. These are learning outcomes? Are there learning outcomes? Well, twice. Nah. I mean, sometimes, obviously, you're forced to do that. And, and like I say, I'm not talking about... When we talk about the practicalities of how I actually teach it, sometimes I'm in systems where I have outcomes. They're there. So you have to put them in there somehow. Because um, you don't just get to do whatever the hell you want, always. Although I've been pretty lucky. And also, choose I choose not to do things when they're really restrictive. So I don't have to teach, so it makes it a lot easier, right? Um, but... That's why I talk about syllabuses and not curriculum. You can do an awful lot inside of a syllabus to frame the way that people approach things. For example? So 30% of that course that I posted on my blog, the one that I taught last year, was a learning network plan. Now, I didn't even tell them how to format it. I just said, I'm going to check it occasionally. You're going to hand it in occasionally. And it has to plan out the next essentially 12 months of what you're going to use any of this stuff for. How it connects with your learning, how it goes back to your own contacts, whatever else. I'm going to keep firing different things at you. I brought in people to speak about the stuff they did. So, you know, um, Dave White came in to talk about residents and visitors. Um, we had the, um, that guy from the Old Spice commercials come in and talk about branding. We did a lot of different sort of stuff where we covered different ideas. You really had the old most, spice guy? Uh, not the guy, the guy who set up the the commercials, the guy who invented the process. Um, cool. Jennifer Jones set it up for me. She said, you should go talk to Dave's classroom. So he went, okay. So the next morning he came in, freaked the students out. It was awesome. <laughs> so uh, basically but I mean, keep assignments vague? Now you're talking about your classes, Jeff. <laughs> Indeed. Um, I, I, I do. But I keep the pro the structure that they have to put together is not. So one of the things that in, in that class, one of the things that they needed to do was teach class. They had to teach something that they that they did not know about when the course started. And they had to teach the, the rest of the class how to do it. It was gonna be this many minutes and do this and this and this. And there was a class review. So in, in the in, during that, there is an open Google Doc, and everybody has to leave comments. And one person is it's a big part of their grade is actually pulling together the feedback during that, and then meeting with the person and presenting them with the feedback structured and organized in a way that's going to help support their learning. Um, so it's got this whole structure around it in terms of how the process works. I just don't care so much about the content because, again, I don't think there's any content you can impart in a short period of time. I mean, you look at language learning. What you learn in the classroom, if you only go to a language class and that's all you ever do, you're never going to learn that language. 
right? It's about giving people the tools they need to go out. You know, you, how many times have you told people to start listening to pop music? Um, you don't have to. They do anyway. No, but you know what I mean? Like that's the that's where you want to get them to go because you want them to find things that they're doing outside that they can continue to do with their life. They're going to actually have them te learn the language. You can give them structures and give them practice and stuff, but you're really trying to create patterns of behavior that they'll carry on elsewhere that will actually allow this thing to happen. At least I'm assuming that's what you're doing. That's the, the goal. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and I think that everything is like that. So as long as the patterns of behavior are structured properly, then you can get them out. The, and, and what the content is irrelevant. If you have content you have to cover, it doesn't matter. Cover it. It's the approach to it that matters. Okay. You know, because, you know, if you present, uh, okay, we have to build a bridge. And, uh, fuck, sorry. The bridge stuff. Always with the bridges. And the planes and the doctors. Those are the three. So, yeah, you've got to cover the way a bridge is built. Now, the truth is, is, well, what's going on over there? I don't know. I get flicker sometimes. Oh, nice. Um, you know, in, in like the, you know, do you want to have a doctor looking at you who has learned this way? Of course, the answer is they all learn this way. Medicine is a flighty kind of profession, really. In, in the bridge stuff, okay, sure, there are things that are the premises of you know, the, when things are on, the, triangles are better than squares. We know it. It's fine. But it's only so important in the process of building an entire bridge. You know, it's such low-level concepts. The stuff that's actually about the creativity and how a bridge comes together is, is a whole other process. I mean, you remember the one in Korea where they had to cut off the middle chunk? I remember the one that collapsed. I don't remember the middle chunk. Oh, you may have been gone. They had, um, there are five different, it's the one that goes over Kuang An. Oh, Kuang, that's a beautiful bridge. It is a beautiful bridge. But when they built it, they had five different engineers, one for each section. And the guy for the middle section was the oldest. And he wasn't really paying attention. And they missed by a foot. Uh -oh. So they had to cut off like 100 feet of the bridge and put that swale, you know that swerve in the middle of it? The kind of cool one? That's to make the bridge fit together. Um, but the problem with that bridge had nothing to do with triangles. It had, uh oh. Hi, John. Hi, John. If you're getting echo, you might want to turn the live stream off. It had everything to do with uh, broad organizational problems, which aren't about triangles, which was my point. Anyway, that was a good one. That never actually came out in the English press. Oh, but, that's very uh, interesting. I'll ask around about that. Yeah, that's a good. That's one of my all-time favorites. And actually, if you ask around and find out it isn't true, by all means, tell me. Um, but uh, I was pretty sure at the time. Are you but, saying you know, it's a like fact? Ten years ago. Oh, who's to say? And can you clarify your stance on facts? Don't believe in them. Don't believe in them. Do you believe facts? Do you have any facts in your life? Uh, the, the magic word there is belief. Um, did you read, uh, did, you see, did you sort of catch the black boxing stuff at all? Uh, yeah. So if you say World War, War, World War II started in 1939, we would call that a fact. The truth is that we all know that, well, in the United States, for instance, people will say that it started in 1941. For the Spanish, it started in 1936. In Ethiopia, it started in 1935. You know, it really depends on what you're talking about. Now, we have a, a dominant discussion that says 1939, and is it when the Germans declared Poland, whatever. It's, it's really messy, actually. And was it really a world war? Like, you take every word along the thing, and it's all messy. But we call it a fact. Even though what we've done, essentially, what Latour would say, is that we've black boxed it. We've just we've argued about it enough that we just don't care anymore. We're going to look at it and just say it's this. Um, but I don't think of them as true. I don't believe in them. I think of them as handy shorthands that allow us to talk to each other about other things. 
and that's what I mean by. I mean, if you when you look at the, the reason why this is important, if you look at George's blog post where he talks about entities, he's talking about facts and things that are true. When I look at entities, I think, oh, there's a short, easy shorthand way of talking about that thing. And the difference is, is that as a from an educational standpoint, as an educator, if I think of things as true, then my job is to give you the true things. If I think of things as shorthands that allow us to talk about stuff, then sometimes I'm going to dive into those things and go, well, yeah, but they're obviously not that. And the fact is, as you get further up the educational ladder, you do you dive more in, right? So we make up essentially lies, and then break them up, and then break them up, and then break them up. And I think that's a ridiculous way to teach people things. <laughs> Why lie to them and unlie as you go through the process? And, and you know, there's definitely kind of a, a political and spiritual component to what you talk about. But I want to check in with John. I would love to hear from him. How are you doing, John? Fine. I'm fine, everyone. We got you. Any uh, comments, questions, confusions, Hi, or John. anything else to share with Dave? Uh, I have uh, got my video, but it seems that it's not working. I don't know why. These things happen. Yes. I may have to check it again then. In, in the meantime, any uh, feedback or questions or comments for Dave? Yes, that could be interesting when Dave mentioned about facts and uh, how he interpreted all those facts. The first question is, when you are saying that you don't believe in the facts, uh, what sort of evidence would you like to have in order to verify <laughs> that claim? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't know what that evidence would be, right? and that's the problem, right? The again, the history of Western approaches to this, and I know that you're living in Japan. But, um, the history of Western approaches to this is that we're looking to to nail them down and make them true. I don't think it's particularly important to do that because I think that almost everything we talk about is steeped in power and politics and negotiated. So no matter how, I, I don't, I don't need them to be proved. But the problem with proof is that I can't imagine what framework you would use to prove it. And I understand that I'm breaking every research rule there is. So I have a position that's unverifiable and therefore and impossible to disprove and therefore not valid. I understand that. I'm just not bothered by it. And it, it sounds to me like you're encouraging uh, complexity of thought, understanding information, knowledge in a way that's not put into the black box that's not overly simplified. World War II did happen. It did begin. Lots Being of aware died. that all, you know, Ethiopia had this experience with it and uh, Poland that yeah. experience is information we can largely agree on. I don't know if there's a word that would work for that, but we have to have sort of a, a common understanding to some extent to move forward in knowledge building, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Like I say, they're convenient shorthands. And if, as long as we're willing to say that a fact is a convenient shorthand, great. I, we need them all the time. Every word I use is one of those things. If I say... But what's the Apple, alternative? If, if the understanding of World War II and all its complexity is a an understanding, a common ground of information? I don't know. I don't know. I mean... History is one of those things that's steeped in multiplicities, right? Because, you know, I was we were watching. Um, yeah, it's Remembrance Day here tomorrow in Canada. I think it's Veterans Day in the states too. And yeah. Beppero Day here in Korea. Is it Beppero Day? It's, oh, it's Ultra Beppero Day. You know, eleven, eleven, eleven. Chocolate, chocolate snacks for everybody. Yeah. Um, so we're watching it, and they're talking about the path, D Day, the path to victory. And, I, and when I look at the path to victory in 2011, I think, really? Victory? Is that what we're calling it now? I mean, this is a terrible war. Lots of people die. But, but we're not really on those sides anymore. And, I mean, if there was ever a hollow victory, the death of 54 million people sounds like one. You know? 
Um, but we still have that idea that we won, as if the we is still the same we that won 65 years ago. And I find that, I think of that as one of the, the outcomes of thinking of things in those discrete boxes. Right? It, it, it hides the complexity and then we forget it's there. Okay, I mean, that makes sense. To, to go back and review, that's useful information, though. The fact that it is framed as victory is very telling and worth examining and worth a, that helps us understand that period in history. Now, future documentaries might not call it the path to victory. They might call it the path to, you know, lots of death. As long as we don't believe in the facts, then there's no problem because then we always think of them as things that need to be penetrated. Or what if we think And that's what I mean by not believing in them. They are. That's that's what I'm saying. When I say believe, I mean I say it kind of argumentatively because I'm kind of like shocking. I know, I know. So I say don't believe because I know that some people are going to misunderstand me like uh, a point of contact did and say, well, the world's not full of mush. And I'm like, yeah, I know the world's not full of mush. When I bang my head on the table, it hurts. Uh, I'm not saying that. It's not there. I'm saying that, is it a table? Well, it's kind of a desk, I guess. I mean, and really, it's a chair or it's whatever else. And Bonnie talks about this, my partner, about the Inuit and the way that they use their language. They don't call things things. They don't reify at all. They may point at the thing over there and say, or this thing, and say, the black thing. They may call it the thing I sat on. They may call it the thing that's in the way. They may call it the damn heavy thing I have to carry around um, without ever using a noun. And they wouldn't use a noun really for it because it's just whatever it happens to be in this context. And, and that's kind of a nice image in terms of, and, and the truth is, that's the way we use the language. You know, we do think of it that way. When we stub our toe on a chair, we don't think, oh, look, it's a chair. We think the damn thing is in the middle of the, like, it's contextual. And yet, when we move to science and we move to this stuff, all of a sudden we want to break it into real hard things. And I think I completely passed over the real question that John had. And, and John, please jump in. It's You've got to fight for the floor here. Yes, that, that is very really interesting. One question is uh, when we manage, we have to, based on facts rather than opinions or beliefs only, it is important that we are managing those things really on those facts rather than just thinking, well, I think this should be done. Uh, there must be evidence to be based upon, and also we make judgment based on facts rather than just beliefs. What do you think? No, I disagree I with disagree. you, it partially, well, not only on one point. Definitely evidence, definitely data, definitely experience, definitely research, definitely all those things, just not the fact one. Um, if, if I'm making um, management decisions for my, my little department at the university, um, I'm going to do research on it. I'm going to see what the field is doing. I'm going to see how that happens. I'm going to see how it comes together. I'll give you a perfect example, a really annoying example. I have this problem. I'm also responsible for the overall implementation of the web structure for my university. Um, if you haven't noticed, um, almost every university website in the world is incomprehensible for 95% of its clients. There are a couple who seem to break that trend, but broadly speaking, there's no way of knowing what is going on. We use language that nobody understands. We use, it's just, it's, it, they're impenetrable. So I'm trying to organize my website so that information about the university is discoverable, not findable, but discoverable. Um, from that perspective, I, I was told it wasn't possible. I've never seen an example of it being done until I found other examples in other fields where people are like, well, of course we do it that Can way. you define that difference? Discoverable versus findable? Findable versus discoverable? If you're going to find something, you already know what it is. Um, so if I'm looking for the dental plan that I have as a student and I want to find it, then I go looking for the dental plan. If I'm a student and I want to know what health services are available to me and I want to flip through them, that's about it being discoverable. right? That's about being able to flip through, oh, I didn't even know I had that. And from a service providing standpoint, that's what you want to be able to do. But that leap, nobody understands what I'm talking about. Because they're looking into the boxes that are there, right? And looking for 
why am I doing this? Where are the facts and evidence that support this? There's none. Because I've never seen anybody do it. I have no facts to support this process at all. Now, I could break it down and say, well, we've had these comments and I could do a survey that said, and, and I could write a survey that would force people to say that they can't find things, but I know they can't really. Um, and I know it's not discoverable because there's no system there to do that. But I have no facts to really support it. I have evidence. I have, I have no idea if this is going to work. And I think that we think of things as facts in order to give us permission to do things. Well, I have these facts to back them up. If facts actually supported positive results, we wouldn't have a failing education system and economy. Like Things would work. So what's the alternative to base decision making on? The same, you're doing the same thing. You're using evidence. You're doing all these things. You're doing research and you're checking stuff and you're looking at data. Just It's just that none of it's true. There's no objective. It's all subjective. It's just, you, you, there's no, you can't work your way through to the right answer. The right answer is never there. At some point, you're always making what, uh, it's funny, this Stephen referenced it earlier this week, the Kierkegaardian leap of faith. At some point, you know, Kierkegaard always said that if you're going to become a Christian, you can read and search and all this stuff and think about it, and connect, but at some point you get to the edge of the cliff and you jump or you don't. Either you believe or you don't believe, and that's jumping off the cliff. That's the Kierkegaardian leap of faith. And he, Kierkegaard had made it. Um, he wasn't criticizing Christianity through that lens. He was talking about his own experience. Um, and I think that that's what the decision-making process is like. You find all the stuff you can and whatever else, and you take the evidence and the stuff and you put it together, and then you jump. And that's what decision-making is. Now... You know, you look at the the stuff that uh, Malcolm Gladwell talks about with the the blink. You know, experts have this wiring that allows them to make decisions. I kind of believe that. Um, I, I think that you get better at making decisions, but essentially, what you're doing is making connections faster. So, but at some point, you realize that you just got to decide. You know, and, and that decision is not it, because you have a bunch of truths lined up like ducks. It's that, given the available evidence, given the sort of weighing out of it, you're like. I've brought it down to these five decisions, and I'm going to pick that one. It's not guessing, per se. It's a weighing of all the things that are available and then finding a path. I think that we fool ourselves when we say that there are facts to guide that. But that's me. I mean, that's that just happens to be the way I see the world. And I'm a postmodernist. I mean, I, post, I, I am a postmodernist. You're a post silly everything. Thing to say. It's a silly thing to say, and, and, and I am always embarrassed to say it because it's not cool to say it. It's, it's actually an embarrassing thing for somebody who studies French theory to say, but I have no other way of explaining it. I don't believe in things being concrete. I think the world is messy. Anybody who has ever tried to raise a child or have a relationship or hold down a job or try to run a project or try to do anything knows that all of those things are hard. And none of those things involve easy decisions or clear-cut paths. And I think that the rest of the world is like that too. On that note, we should probably head into the home stretch. Any final comments or questions, John? Yes, I think it depends on which frame of reference and the lens that you are using. If you are using a scientific lens, then you will more likely be basing on facts and data. And if you are using a social lens, then you are looking at it from a relationship perspective and also you are looking for conversation but on the other hand if you are going to base your judgment on beliefs then there could be a lot of risk involved when you are talking with people and uh, so because as you mentioned in, in the university environment you have to base all your judgment on those facts and data in order to convince others. Otherwise they will say, well, we are the evidence where you base your judgment on. And that could be a challenge for educators as well as researchers. Because as researchers, we have to make sure that our claims are backed up by evidences. And these evidences may be representative of a population rather than just uh, individuals. I think I'll put it back to Dave to elaborate on that and uh, see what he thinks. 
Yeah, I, and in some degree, we may be having a language barrier here because I don't know how the word fact translates. Um, evidence is good. I'm not saying that we shouldn't look at evidence and that we should just pick ideas out of the air. What I'm saying is that none of those pieces of evidence lead to things that are true, real in the world. They lead to, you know, if you look at the way that we're research, I don't, a science or non-science, I don't actually see the difference. I mean, so much of science is built on quantum theory that no one understands. So I don't believe in the fact of any of it because it's all built in this weird quantum theory package. Everybody kind of goes, I don't really know how that works. Um, and if that's the foundation you're working under, then there's a lot of mishy-mashy stuff under there. Um, but absolutely, you need to do research. I mean, it, if you look at narrative inquiry, it's certainly considered a research approach, and it's pretty wishy-washy. Like, there's an awful lot of not evidence that's involved in that process. Unless you think of narrative inquiry as evidentiary, which is okay. But again, I'm not making the distinction between random things that I made up today versus facts, but rather facts as true things versus evidence being kind of a bunch of different pieces of evidence that come together in a network that you pull out ideas from. Am I missing a chat room discussion? Uh, Julia is uh, hanging out or in the chat room, and I said, come join the hangout, but she said it's too noisy. And I said, learning is messy and noisy at its best, no problem. Uh, and she said she had high production values standards. We, we don't. We have very low standards, so... <laughs> As evidenced sorry, by sorry. the fact that we go ahead. Sorry, John, go ahead. Yes. How about this fact? We are now having a conversation with each other. This is a fact. Don't you agree? By conversation, what do you mean, John? So we um, are exchanging our views and critiquing about what we are thinking and using critical thinking to take out all those points and then asking questions to make sure that we are understanding each other and also critiquing and, on the points and those from are, different those are, perspectives. Those are all really great short forms to talk about what we're talking about, no doubt. There's no doubt that we're having this, that this is happening and I'm not doubting the reality. It's just the usage, any of the words that you use whenever you talk are built on a whole bunch of other premises that are hidden. And I'm not suggesting that if, if you're going to talk about this in a curricular in a curricular context and you're gonna say in order to complete this process you need to have a conversation with X and we're going to evaluate whether or not you had a conversation by Y criteria okay I, I understand that it's not it's annoying when I say oh it depends what you mean by 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 conversation I saw the look on Jeff's face that's a fact that's a fact the thing is is when you actually take that and then you try to do something with it and you say we're going to have people have conversations. We're going to evaluate that happens. How is it, Jeff? And, and I don't. Um, how is it for you, Jeff, when you try to evaluate whether or not one of your students has had a conversation? It's very qualitative. It's not quantitative. Is and what do you mean by like? Is it a conversation? Like, how do I make sure that they've done enough to actually qualify for it being a conversation? And then how do I measure that and stuff? That's where it becomes a problem. But it's getting no back problem. to like the the science stuff, I mean. Do you see that water is comprised of two molecules of hydrogen and one of oxygen? Uh, it's a beautiful shorthand. Do we know what happens inside the atom? Of course not. We're not even close. Um, so, no, again, it's very useful to talk about it that way, and probably it's something like that. But... <clears throat> yes. Yes. When I walk down the street, I'm on top of things and I move along. I'm not doubting reality. I'm saying that there are shorts, there are forums. Every year, we come up with another realization where we go, oh, this thing that we were sure was true. Well, kind of really isn't. And as long as we, I mean, that's what the scientific, they're theories. And by being theories, they're not true. They're the best understanding that we have of the thing right now. Great. I think that's a wonderful thing, and we should all embrace theories in the science. But look at the craziness that happens in the global climate change debate. The main criticism in climate change is they say, well, there's this one thing that doesn't reflect your theory. And you're like, it's a theory. It's not going to explain everything. It's not supposed to. But that, but 
the, the whole argument and the thing that they play on is that things are true or they're not true. And as long as you look at the world in terms of fact and not fact, you blur the gray and you allow power to all these people who try to use truth and all this stuff to their own ends. And you take away the critical sort of penetration of any discussion. So when you apply it to a real discussion, something that's important or a political issue or whatever, people start going from one side to another. It's the 1% versus the 99%. Really? It's not really. You know, there are lots of people in the 1% who I'm sure, like Buffett, who's more than willing to give his money away. Um, and there are lots of people in the 99% who I'm sure are perpetrating terrible economic crimes on other people. But if we think about them in categories as true things, we get ourselves into that trouble all the time. All right. Well, on that note, uh, John, do you want to get a, a final comment in? Uh oh. Yes. Would you interpret the facts as a truth, or mm -hmm. would you interpret it as a, an interpretation of the truth? Neither. I wouldn't include the truth in either explanation. So I don't, if you have, if you are confronted, I don't know what truth would be in that yes, sense. If, if you are confronted with some facts, how would you handle that? Say someone is telling you that I love you, and you, if you are go, not going to interpret that as a fact, what will it become? I'm sorry. The fact <coughs> in question is I love you. Yes. Say for instance. It, his partner Bonnie is going to tell him that yeah. she loves sometimes you. Sometimes she does, and sometimes you she doesn't. <laughs> How would you interpret that? Is it a fact or is it not? It's not. You don't believe that, then. It's not true in that sense. It's way more complicated than that. The way that Bonnie feels about me is it I mean how how annoying must it be to live with me John imagine what it's like to have somebody like me in the house <laughs> she has a very complex relationship to how she feels about me sometimes that is a very positive feeling and sometimes she just doesn't really want me near the house and and that's the reality of it I mean you've you've chosen an ideal example really because uh, living with me is really weird um, and she's also a post structuralist so it's weird both ways um, and actually, her I came to this stuff through her work. So yeah, how can I, you make I hear judgment it and I think, then? What's that? I, I, how can you make judgment then? Say, for instance, if you are going to tell her that you love her, so would she believe on you, in you then? Believe? Uh, actually, love is very much a factor of belief. Um, she might. She would probably more likely go, I wonder what he wants. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is fundamental in the basic because if we are not going to rely on facts and interpret the facts in order to make a judgment, then I think the decision that we make could be a little bit risky. And we I, I, have, I agree with if you. If I understand, you're not against making judgments. You just don't perceive those judgments being based on what John is considering facts. That's right. It's based right. on what? The best evidence and the best guesses you can make. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think of science as a history of guesses, and it really has been. And it still is. You know, I mean, anybody who's been to the doctor's office with an unknown ailment, which is most of us, they just kind of guess their way through the process. You know, that's the best that they can do. They make a bunch of guesses, they throw a bunch of stuff at you and hope that it works out. And I think of most of science that way, and I think most of our lives that way. There are things that, there are leaps of faith that we all have to make, um, and, and those are part of our, our framework. But I think that any time we assume that facts are real, we, we lose the real complexity of our society and of the complexity of our interactions and the complexity of the natural world. And I don't think I'm that... Mm. Go ahead. Yeah, I like your mention of the framework because it depends on which sort of framework that you are referring to. If you shift your framework, then the lens that you are using will be different and yes. you will see things totally differently. Yes. For instance, yes. if you are saying, well, facts are just an approximation of the truth, that's fine. Everyone agrees on that. But if we are not going to collect the facts and then make a judgment, then we might be on a very risky end. Yeah. 
<laughs> because people will say, well, why are you making a judgment based upon just opinions? Where are your facts? I, I think that it's only... I understand what you're saying. I, I still think that all we do is, even if you take what we call a fact is often a formalized opinion. So you take the, the peer-reviewed research process. For the most part, what that ends up meaning is that somebody follows a process that, if done properly and, and honestly, tends to weed out a number of kinds of mistakes. And then the peer review process is meant to weed out another number of kinds of mistakes that we have noticed tend to lead to bad things. That process doesn't make things true it does its best job to weed out the kind of things that we think that we know get into that process and when you cite that you're citing something that is not true or exists you're citing the best thing we can kind of cobble together given the things we know about the world um, and and you know that's what keeps somebody like Einstein from getting published because his thing was super new and nobody knew what the hell he was talking about and it took somebody like like um, Max, whatever his name was, to look at it and go he, to be established enough to not be threatened by it, because then the, those systems are about controlling truth, right? They're about power and all the rest of those things. So the peer review process doesn't necessarily control truth; it controls power. And, and so what you come out of it with is not something true, but something validated, which is something entirely different, right? So I I think that. The peer review process, the research process, all those things are very, very good things to do to evidence to clean out the mistakes that we can, that we know are mistakes that we can get rid of, right? So it forces people to use, well, to, to, to speak simply, to think deeply about things, which is going to be better than people not thinking deeply about things, right? It forces us to say, oh, did you even check to see if anybody's ever done this before? It, it does all those things, which are valid, but and helpful but it doesn't make them true and I'm afraid we're gonna have to leave it there because my understanding of current reality is that I have to go to work and that if I do that they're gonna pay me and if I don't they're not going to so that's a uh, fact <laughs> my wife considers that a fact uh, so <laughs> Dave congratulations you survived your change 11 week yeah. Oh. <laughs> Nicely done. It's been, a, I think, a really interesting uh, week, and I hope you enjoy a few beverages following yeah, this. And okay. uh, we'll look forward to Change 12, where you have all sorts of new, exciting yeah, right. uh, yeah. non-facts to share. And Jeff, thanks for all your stuff. And John, I really do, I really do enjoy your posts. I really do enjoy the engagement yeah. you've had and all the stuff that we've done. It's really nice to chat with you. Yes, I appreciate all this, and you are all an inspiration to me too provocative and also I think the things that can I pose a last question sure you, sure. Uh, you found that 60% of the people are liking you very much and then another 30% greatly admire you so if that is a fact then how would you claim that you don't believe it it's a measurement of the things I've been able to find. It's not a fact. I don't know. There could be another whole pocket of people I don't know about. There could be people who never spoke to say it. A lot of those people could be lying. Um, could a lot of those tomorrow. people could really be fooling, fooling themselves. Like There's all kinds of things in there that could change. Don't try to trick me, John. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I think this I is interesting because joking. we understand better each other's perspective by asking questions and mm -hmm. by responding to that and reflecting upon how it works in our working lives as well as in life like when I ask you whether your yeah, wife is uh, telling you that she loves me you or not I think that is a critical question and this is about facts this is not just about opinions or beliefs I can promise you, you that Bonnie will tweet you that, that it's not a fact <laughs> 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 but you, well this is uh, personal but I think it is important that we understand each other to that extent. We are talking from our hearts and minds, and that is a fact. It is not about something that is not true. It's about what we are telling each other about our true feelings, true thinking. And I would say you believe it's a fact. Dave believes it's something less <laughs> finalized, concrete. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I really do have to go. It has been note, great. See you, Jeff. Bye, John. Okay. Yeah, bye. Thanks, all. Thanks, all.